other that. Uh, my name's Evan, and um, this is the very first episode, um, like of my podcast. Um, a little about myself. Um, I currently live in Melbourne, and I also recently graduated from uni. Uh, and as to why I started the podcast. It was because I pretty much didn't know what I wanted to do throughout, like, university. Uh, and from talking to other people, like, they also felt the same way. So I thought of recording, um, like, chats like this where I'm asking people for advice um, and putting them up. So, if yeah, this is the very, very first episode, um, I'll be trying to Lauren Kaplan. Um, and there's just some really great insights, um, especially towards the end. Um, so I'll leave you to enjoy it. See ya. Thanks for, um, coming on, um, the podcast today. Um, yeah. Okay. Wait, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming on today. Um, I thought... Before we get into questions, I might ask you just sort of if you could get, get a, um, give a sense of uh, what you're passionate about at Startup mm-hmm. Work, um, mm-hmm. because we know that you work in startups and in VC, but I think it'd be good just to sort of know like what other dimensions there mm-hmm. are. Like, sure. Yeah. yeah, I can talk about what, what drew me to this. I guess, field, um, what what drew me to the industry over time, if that's helpful as well. I guess for me, um, you know, my my background, and I'm sure we'll touch on this a little bit, I was much more in the creative industry. So, uh, you know, I studied creative writing and journalism and theatre, and I thought that that kind of creativity uh, was the most important thing, and I struggled to sort of fit that into a business context. But over the course of some of my early professional experiences, I understood what power and creativity business really has. And that led me to um, understanding more about this new emerging space of startup businesses, which are essentially more creative than than structured from a business perspective, really trying a whole bunch of different strategies and, and trying to create change and impact in the work that they're doing. So when I, when I learned about that first through um, social innovation or social enterprise businesses, but then eventually proper technology startups, I was just so, so excited by uh, the real potential that these businesses had to change the world and the real need for creativity and um, innovation and and entrepreneurial thinking to enable these businesses to exist in the first place. So that's what led me to uh, kind of the the work in startups and the venture capital or investing side of things is really just that, you know, the second most important thing these businesses need is a lifeline to be able to experiment and play and create. And what differentiates startups from normal businesses is that they have this license to explore and try and test new things, new behaviours, uh, that that will ultimately change industries or change the way we, we live and work, really. Uh, whereas a, a normal business or a kind of small to medium enterprise, whatever it might be, needs to find the fastest pathway to revenue to be able to survive. Uh, and that, that usually doesn't require as much creative thinking or out-of-the-box strategy as a startup does. So, um, you know, to be one of the people who could identify great talent and, uh, you know, find ideas worth backing and worth supporting was the role that I eventually felt like I could play, um, you know, in this startup industry. Yeah, and this leads into, I guess, the next question, but Mm -hmm. um, how did you sort of, like, navigate those years after university and sort of figuring out, like you mentioned, that you can sort of actually apply creativity mm. within the business world. Um, it's a great question. And it's it's one that I think is a really meaningful part of my story where I could have ended up in a very different career. Um, so as I said, I studied a Bachelor of Creative Industries at QUT in, in Brisbane. Uh, But actually, this was the first year that the Bachelor of Creative Industries degree had been offered in the way that it was as an interdisciplinary degree, meaning you had sub minors, uh, you know, you could choose multiple things to study, whereas typically people were doing double degrees or, you know, uh, two majors, whatever it might be. But this idea of 
multiple different industries and disciplines all under this creative umbrella uh, was was what excited me so much because I thought it's the connection of the dots between these industries, whether it's, uh, you know, international cinema, which is one of the most favourite subjects that I studied, or narrative nonfiction, or even just thinking about the, the basic journalistic skills that you need to to kind of report and, and write, um, you know, incisive journalistic pieces, all of those things coming together in a, um, in a bucket that was uniquely mine uh, felt like a great way to start both my kind of tertiary or my, like my academic career post school, uh, but also would lead to an interesting career. Uh, but what I realized probably in the last semester of my degree or what happened was that I had a huge amount of panic because I realized that this particular degree, unlike you know, my friends who were doing arts and law or um, economics or accounting, business, science, whatever it might be, education, that led to a very specific job. Um, my my uh, choice in university course led me exactly nowhere. <laughs> there was no section of the paper that I could turn to. And yes, we looked in the paper for jobs back in those days. <laughs> um, that was like, you know, here are all the creative industries jobs. I mean, arts management jobs were the natural conclusion, but, um, and, and I did spend some time in, in the arts um, working for a community festival in Brisbane, uh, but that was not going to satisfy me. And I realized there was some other strings to the bow that I needed to add to take this foundation in creativity and creative thinking, um, you know, understanding uh, flow states and, and all that kind of creative theory that actually underpins a lot of entrepreneurship in a way, um, I needed to be able to add these other dimensions into the mix. Um, so, so actually in the last semester, um, when I was having this panic and I went to sort of careers counsellor and he was like, don't worry, you, you know, your GPA is good, you'll find a job, <laughs> um, but didn't necessarily tell me what that job would look like. Um, or maybe the jobs that were being suggested I knew were definitely not the sort of things that I wanted to, whether it was like a, a kind of management consulting path or something much more traditional, um, I, I sort of was still open for a challenge and a risk. And my, uh, a tutor, a, a lecturer for one of my last subjects, um, she basically pulled me aside after one of my tutes and was like, what are you doing next year? Uh, and I basically had no idea. This was very much the time that I was wondering about this stuff. And she offered me a job with her um, small company, which was doing very um, leading edge training and development, team building, leadership training based in theatre studies principles. So um, using forms from theatre to uh, bring about change in, in organisations through role play, through other kinds of creative forms. So that that ended up being my first job out of the university and was such an eye-opening uh, job for so many reasons, whether it was being exposed to the way business works from a very different vantage point, sort of having a, a bird's eye view of people and culture and organisations and, and being exposed to a lot of the theory around, uh, you know, team building, leadership, um, you know, some really amazing books that were kind of popular at the time, emotional intelligence, um, that, that became the foundation that I built upon for the next stages of my career. Um, and, and from there, it sort of ended up at an arts festival and having exposure to um, internal communications. Uh, and, and from there, I sort of made, it, made a progress into the startup ecosystem as well. Yeah. Like I was going to ask, like, how did you sort of end up sort of in a, in a field that you're passionate about, but it really seemed just random how you, how you should offer your job and that just, um, led to whatever yeah. else. And yeah, so it kind of seems like you can sort of just do what I guess you love doing and then. Yeah. yeah, I think that was definitely the approach that I had taken, even in choosing my high school subjects. Um, you know, my, my parents were supportive in that they never really wanted me to do things that didn't make me happy. There was no real um, push for me to be a certain thing or study a certain thing. While they might have wanted to know that I had good job security, they weren't determined to see me become a lawyer, which was perhaps an idea that I had at some point earlier on. Um, and, and that freedom, I guess, meant that I really could carve my own path. But I think what I would say is it was that the approach that I wanted to do the new and the different thing 
which enabled me to recognize the opportunities that I was being given. I mean, when I, when I was offered that job, literally I didn't apply for any other jobs at the time. It, it just felt like the chance worth taking. And that, that happened uh, a couple more times in my career, uh, which I can sort of tell you about now quickly if it's helpful, um, you know, to be able to, to see the opportunities that you're being handed and to, to trust that that's the right next step. So um, just another quick example of that is when I was working at the arts festival, I got a call from the same tutor, my first boss, um, and said, she said, I've got another opportunity for you, but you have to move to Sydney. And it was kind of like, that's all I needed to, to know from her. Um, and she was actually, uh, had created an opportunity with a client of hers um, for this kind of special projects liaison to work directly with the national director of an architecture firm, um, which, as I mentioned, became more of a kind of innovation and internal communications role over time. Uh, but essentially it was a role that didn't exist that was created just for a specific person to fill um, to work with this with this uh, national director. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all I needed to know to, to sort of resign <laughs> relatively quickly. And, you know, in eight weeks I was moving to Sydney uh, and I spent 14 years there um, off the back of that initial leap. Uh, so that's one other example. Um, and then probably just the one example that does become my direct segue into the startup ecosystem was as I was, you know, two and a half years later, still working for the architectural firm. And I had the opportunity to uh, meet an author named Rachel Botsman through some kind of volunteer work I was doing on the side. Um, I was always trying to put myself in the way of the kind of people that I wanted to be around. And when I realized that the, the role that I had wasn't necessarily putting me in the line of, of the kind of work that I wanted to do and the kind of people that I wanted to be surrounded by, I started doing a whole lot of uh, yeah, volunteer work and getting involved in the, the startup and the social enterprise community. Uh, and this author, uh, Rachel, she had uh, almost finished her first book, The Rise of Collaborative Consumption, What's Mine Is Yours, The Rise of Collaborative Consumption. And she told me about this movement that she had been observing um, online where people were using the power of the internet to connect strangers, to collaborate, to share things that were otherwise kind of locked in their garage. Um, you know, this was the start of businesses like Airbnb, which was 30 people at the time uh, in, in San Francisco, uh, and of course now a worldwide phenomenon, uh, but this was such early days and, and what I trusted in that was the power of this movement and, and the potential to really change the world over the next few years. So when Rachel asked if I would work with her to help her launch the book, um, to, to launch the global movement across the world and work with these amazing founders from Brian and Joe and Nate at Airbnb, Leah at TaskRabbit, John at Zimride, which became Lyft, um, I didn't need to be asked twice, um, you know, whether that was the right next step for me. This was another adventure um, to be exposed to the new um, and innovative thinking and to be exposed to some of the best entrepreneurs uh, we've seen probably over the last decade as well. So I uh, yeah, quit my job and, and started working for her initially part time. I, I took a part, I left a full time job um, and trusted that I would find, you know, the other work to support me until it became full time. And it led to a kind of five five year um role and, and business partnership with Rachel over time as we built that out. Um, and yes, again, was my path into startups and eventually venture capital as well. Yeah. Um, like what would you say sort of like allowed you to sort of take the leap and just mm. take those like opportunities? Cause um, it's, it's definitely like a really unconventional path. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I would be, you certainly have to acknowledge that I was, um, you know, there's a level of privilege that comes along with being able to take an opportunity like that. Like I was, you know, in a situation where I felt comfortable enough to say no to full-time work and take a part-time role without feeling like I was going to struggle. Um, so that was really important. I had a partner at the time and the, together we were able to kind of still afford our apartment and, um, you know, to, to get by week to week. So I think that's that's important to recognise. But I think I just also trusted that it would lead to um, something much more interesting and expansive than any other job that I would take, which would ultimately guarantee, um, you know, the, the safety net and the, and the opportunities and the income or the, the kind of 
um, future success that that I believed would be possible if I pursued that pathway. So, um, you know, it it was lucky and I was lucky, but I think it was knowing that if I trusted those instincts and the belief that this was a really credible opportunity and a huge um, period of time to, to be participating in, you know, in terms of that economic trend of the sharing economy or collaborative consumption. Uh, it was just, you know, it's kind of like the advice that Sheryl Sandberg was given, I think, by Larry Summers uh, in relation to Google or maybe it was to Facebook, I can't remember which, um, you know, when you're offered a seat on the rocket ship, you don't ask which seat you just get on or, you know, something I'm paraphrasing, but it's like I knew that that was a rocket ship for me that I couldn't kind of question or say no to. Yeah. And maybe talking about like, you know, university students who have just graduated mm -hmm. and um, I think like I, I found that uh, sort of a lot of the other people in my degree, they went sort of to further study. Mm -hmm. um, but then I actually sort of thought of doing that as well. But then um, I guess it wasn't something I wanted to do, mm. but then it's like, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. I just not study. Mm. Um, but now it's sort of like, I don't like figuring out what it is I want to do. Right. Um, so I guess like, I don't know, like what advice would you have for those who just graduated and mm. sort of feel that further study isn't for them, but you know, not sure what to do next. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a common experience and I think it's okay to feel like that. Um, I consider myself to be a lifelong learner in the sense that I have gone back and done additional study or um, added different qualifications. Um, and I never saw finishing my degree as the last time I would study, but I certainly yeah didn't want to continue studying. I saw the degree as a means to an end. I mean, it was only a three year degree and, and by today's standards, some people are spending four or five, six years at university to get increasing qualifications. Um, but I didn't see that they had to be mutually exclusive. I just wanted to get into the workforce and start participating and learn through that experience what might be the most interesting things to continue studying. There's, there's a sense that sometimes being at university can put you in a bit of a vacuum, although a lot of unis do a better job of kind of creating that real world alignment these days and there are certainly opportunities to to get involved in work experiences through that time uh, but there's nothing like being in a company any company and and understanding the way the world works through that paradigm that is so hard to learn from the outside so um i think overthinking the first step after university is almost part of the problem and any first step will lead you to the to the right next step you know um having to have this goal in mind of of where you need yourself to be in a certain number of years almost defeats the the purpose that the early part of your career can be as much about curiosity and taking some of these big risks and big leaps um like like i did i guess there's a point in your career where that becomes harder because you have you know increased responsibility um you know children to look after all these kinds of things. Whereas um, if you're at that point in your career where, um, you know, you have a certain amount of money you need to survive and, and maybe put some away for savings or whatever it might be, you can take a lot more of those um, risks in the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, so, you know, I, I certainly would just advocate for um, working for other people as a first experience is important, but I also think there's so much opportunity to create and build now from the get-go um, and that you know for for students who are graduating um, who are thinking about starting their own business I think it's an awesome thing to do but I don't think it's um, the only pathway I think there are plenty of ways to fast track that learning that doesn't involve you having to kind of um, you know have that experience in isolation you can actually learn from others first there was something else that I've always kept in mind is kind of you know, first you build a stranger's house, then you build your friend's house, and then you build your own. And I think there's, um, you know, the attitude you can bring to 
um, the stranger's house is a little bit more observatory and you're not really, um, you don't have skin in the game necessarily. Uh, when you're building with your friend, you know, you have a lot more care and consideration and, and you're learning things that will ultimately allow you to create the best possible house for yourself over time. I think um, that's a really useful analogy when you think about collecting work experience um, and, and who you might want to work for and what you can learn in each of those kinds of circumstances as well. How, how do you, um, I guess, go about finding those experiences that you sort of are just really, like, passionate about or mm. just feel like it's the right thing? Because um, mm. I guess it, it might seem like that the only thing that is put in front of you is just, like, applying for graduate jobs. Mm. Um yeah, but are there sort of like other pathways? Yeah, it's a great question because I think graduate jobs can be useful as a means, but it's not something that you want to kind of see as the means to an end in, in terms of the career pathway that it provides. It, it almost gives you a, um, a basic framework um, an introduction to work that's quite safe and supportive as opposed to having to strike out on your own and find an entry-level position in kind of an emerging company or whatever it might be, which are, you know, much harder to come by because there's less of them. Um, but um, I think, so sorry, the question was around how can how can um, people find the right first opportunity? Um, yeah, maybe aside from those just... The ones that are uh, kind of really obvious. Yeah. Yeah. More, yeah. That's conventional. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the best thing for a graduate to do is to understand. I, I think we sometimes get obsessed with the ideal state of our future career and all of the steps to, on the way to that place feel frustrating or, you know, like we're just doing admin work, but we really want to do this. And, um, you know, I think knowing what that one key skill is that might be your superpower um, to build from. Like you don't have to uh, be the full professional you straight away. You just need to be able to add value in one specific way and and use that as the, the kind of door opener to the kind of environment you'd like to be in. Um, you may not be playing the kind of role that you want to play in that environment, but you at least get a ringside seat um, and you know that you're adding a specific kind of value. So if you can kind of consider your, yes, your study and your experience, but but what your unique superpower might be, like maybe you're obsessed with, um, you know, SEO or growth hacking, or, um, you know, you'll have an experience and a knowledge set that comes from being um, of your generation and, uh, you know, being digitally native with so many of these new social tools, all that sort of stuff. If you, if you know what that, that superpower is and you can find the kind of company that you aspire to belong to long-term or that you aspire to create um, and offer that superpower up, uh, you know, you might be surprised where some of those conversations can lead. Um, but I think part of it is about recognising that it will take a lot longer to be um, playing the kind of role that you ideally want to create long term and it's about collecting those skills and experiences and adding the strings to your bow along the way um, I think that's that having having some of those um, you know conversations with people who inspire you and, and getting a sense of what what would make a difference in their company for example um, is a great place to start yeah so I might go into the, the final question mm -hmm. um, so what is like one piece of advice uh, that you've heard that has really, I guess, shaped a life that you think would be relevant to, you know, the uni students listening here? Mm, great question. One piece of advice. It's it's maybe not advice that has been given to me necessarily, but something that I continue to learn along the way in my career. Uh, it's, it, it sort of relates to the, the kind of theatre and performance background that I did have through school and, and through uni. Um, this recognition of times when I held back my performance uh, and that I didn't kind of 
give everything to that moment um, and for, for fear of being judged, for fear of doing it badly, for fear of being wrong. And I think if you take that as an analogy uh, and wrap it across the rest of your life, which is, which is how I like to think about it now, it's how often we self-censor from fear of any of those things, judgment, rejection, um, being wrong, uh, and how much faster life moves if you can shake yourself free of that and and put yourself out there. The people that I see being successful um, are out there acting, you know, being being who they are regardless of those things and really sending a strong message about who they are and what they can do in all its glory, not not um, needing to be perfect but, but needing to really have a go and have a try. And, you know, what you're doing with this podcast is a real example of that. You're, um, you know, facing a, a fair bit of fear I think you have around um, the nervousness of, of interviewing people that you don't know. Um, you're creating something that's going to be of value, not just to you, but but to the community that you're that you're trying to serve. Um, you know, the, the students who are asking these same questions, uh, and that I think is an example of, of the advice that I am trying to take more for myself um, to to know that your own fear and limitations actually are the things that sideline your career or, or reduce the amount of opportunity available to you so uh yeah don't don't let that get in your way uh, and now's the time to push past it because you'll have a lot a lot less um expectation about what good looks like at this point in your career and it gets harder as you get older because there's so many um, people to benchmark yourself against and, and examples of what good looks like uh, but right now for, for you and for your colleagues, um, your peers at university, anything is possible uh, and, and you can kind of create that benchmark for yourselves. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, <laughs> and I guess we'll leave the audience with that. Um, but yeah, thanks again for, for coming on and I've definitely got a lot out of it myself. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking the plunge and, and creating this and putting it out there. So I appreciate the questions and the interest. Great. Uh, cool. So that was a very first episode. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and also got something out of it. Um, you know, I thought it was great, like training to Lauren and hearing about her perspective. And I thought that, you know, that last piece of advice was, um, you know, really inspirational. Um, but I also wanted to touch on the, that blooper uh, at the beginning of the interview and I included that because I wanted to show that it's normal to feel nervous when you're doing things for the first time um, but yeah so I also want to give a big shout out to Faye and Joel um, they helped a lot in terms of getting this podcast started. Um, but aside from that, um, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll be releasing episodes, um, every week. Not sure on the day yet, but yeah, I hope to see you around.